Well, if you have your Bibles open to John chapter 15, we're in a new series today. And one more time, I just want to welcome all our friends and guests who are here, especially if you're here for the first time. And I want to give a very special shout out to any of you who were here at Easter as visitors, and yet you're back. I want to give a special shout out to you. Uh, it was after a Christmas service one year, and uh, it was an, an awesome service, and the the, the lobby was full of people, and I remember just standing there in the lobby, and I see this guy. He's making his way for the door, but when he locked eyes with me, he walked over to me really briskly with a big smile on his face, and he walks over and gives me the biggest hug, and he says, thank you so much. That was such an awesome service. It was so moving, so powerful. He said, I am definitely going to come back next Christmas. He said, I'll be back next year for sure. It was that good. I'm like, really, that good? That you would wait a whole year to come back. And, and I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but this is a reality. A reality that, that we've noticed that there are many CEOs in this world. Many CEOs who are Christmas and Easter only people. Who will come to church who have no problem worshiping the newborn king on Christmas or worshiping the risen king on Easter. But the rest of the year live as if they were their own kings, who will live making their own decisions, going about their own way, living as if they're their own bosses, CEOs. And, and God really is not interested in gathering CEOs. He wants to be the king of our hearts, not just the Savior who saves us from our sin, but he wants to be the Lord who governs our lives. That's what he wants. You know, it was awesome at Easter time. Uh, many people came in. We try to emphasize that it's not a one-time commitment. It's not a one-time prayer you pray. It's not coming to church one time in the year, but it really is a journey with Jesus. It's walking with him in relationship. And, and, and so we today kick off a new series, very intentionally called Abide. Abide. Why? Because it's about being connected, staying in, dwelling in, remaining in Christ and he in us. At that Easter service, many people came to Christ. It was so encouraging to see all the hands that were raised and, and we could hear it because we were praying together out loud as we confessed that we believe Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. And so many people came to Christ and prayed a prayer of salvation. Do you remember the first time you came to Christ? Do you remember that coming to Christ moment? And maybe you too prayed a prayer of salvation. Remember at my old church, my former church, we had a small group. And one of uh, my friends in the small group shared with us about how his stepdad, Ron, came to Christ. See, he tells the story of his stepdad, Ron, when he was a youth, a high school student. He didn't grow up going to church, didn't have a relationship with Jesus. But there was this time in those high school years that he felt very guilty about his sin. And there was this one particular night he was at the dinner table, and he was so overwhelmed with this feeling of guilt, the shame for what he had done. And I don't know what he had done, but he just could not handle it. So he left the dinner table, went to his room, and just wept. Didn't have an appetite. Now, here's what my friend tells me. I don't know if this is an odd thing or a God thing, but there was a pastor in that community who, for some reason, was compelled and convicted to somehow reach out to that high school student, Ron. They apparently didn't have any kind of relationship. Maybe they've met once or twice before. I don't know. But he just felt like, I need to call Ron. And so he gets a hold of Ron's number. He calls Ron up that night. And he says, he says, you don't know me. This might sound strange to you, but I felt like God wanted me to call and reach out to you. He said, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I'm here at the church. If you need to talk, I'm here. Ron hung up the phone. My friend tells me that Ron did not walk over to the church that night. He said Ron ran to the church. He ran to the church to hear what the pastor had to say. And the pastor, I'm sure, shared with him the gospel, the good news of forgiveness in Christ, and that, that Jesus came to save him. That night, Ron prayed a prayer of salvation. He came to Christ. 
I don't know what your story is. I know there's a lot of stories in this room or wherever you're listening from, there's testimonies of how you came to Christ and maybe you ended up praying a prayer of salvation. And the question I want to ask today and throughout the series is, is a prayer of salvation enough to truly be saved? Is that enough? And so that's why we start this series called Abide, John chapter 15. I want to show you that Jesus doesn't just want you to come to him. He wants you to come and abide. Come and remain, dwell in him. See, John chapter 15, let me set up the story for you. So John 15 is what uh, we call the upper room discourse. Actually, it takes place in John 13 all the way through John 17. And it's the upper room discourse because they're there in that upper room. You might be familiar with that last night before Christ was going to be crucified. It's when they had the last supper. But beyond that supper, there was a lot of conversation, and Jesus was saying some last words. And among the things that he said, here's what he said in John chapter 15, starting from verse 1. He said to the disciples, I am the true vine. Circle the word true if you can. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the words that I've spoken to you. Abide in me. Highlight that word abide and every time you see it. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. And so right there, Jesus starts off by making this declaration. He says, I am the true vine. Why why does he make that claim that I am the true vine? We'll understand that in that day, it was very possible that as the disciples were walking with Jesus and journeying with him for those three years, that as they went to the region of Jerusalem, that they would pass by the temple. And at the temple, you could see the golden vine that adorned the, the, the temple gates. Right there at the top, you see this golden vine. Why is the vine there? Well, because the vine was like a, an emblem, a national emblem. It gave them a sense of pride. Because Israel was often likened to the vine of God throughout their Old Testament scriptures. They were often uh, described as God's vineyard. For example, Isaiah chapter 5 verse 7 is one of many scriptures. It says this, the vineyard of the Lord is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And so for many of the the Jews, there's this great confidence and security in belonging to the vine. Many of the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, I'm sure, took pride that by birth, they belonged to the people of God. They were born into the, the vineyard. And yet Jesus says here in the upper room, he says, no, listen, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. In other words, there's no other way to experience real life and real fruit and relationship with God the Father other than through me, the true vine. In fact, one chapter earlier, there in that upper room, John chapter 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, the true vine. And so he emphasizes that we have to abide To abide means to dwell, to remain in the vine, and he in us, if we are to have real relationship. It doesn't matter your region, doesn't matter your religion, doesn't matter your race. Real relationship comes only through Christ, the true vine. Now, how do we know if we are truly abiding in Jesus? How do we know? Well, what what if I took a branch like this and I told you, hey, uh, this is a grape branch taken from a vineyard. How many would believe that this is a grape branch? Anybody? Anybody here believe it's a grape branch? Okay. Some of you are like, maybe because you're, you're a pastor and you're telling us that it is, so maybe it is. 
But then what if I said, okay, well, no, actually I have a, another branch that I took from a vineyard, and it's this. And what if I said, hey, this is a, a uh, grape branch that I took from a vineyard. How many would believe me now? Yeah? Would you believe me? Ooh. <laughs> would you believe me, Mike? Yeah? How about you? Nice catch, Mark. Would you believe me this is a grape van- branch? How do you know? How do you know? Because the fruit. Because there's grapes all- coming off of it. And so the, the, the fruit is the evidence of what it is. It's tangible evidence that it is what you say it is. It is a grape branch from a vine. And so when Jesus says that when you abide in me, you will bear much fruit, that fruit is the evidence, tangible, real evidence that we are in Christ and the life of Christ and the character of Christ and the truth of Christ and the power and the strength of Christ is flowing into us. And when it flows into us, it will come out of us. It's the evidence that we are connected to Christ. Here, over and over again, Jesus makes it very clear. For example, verse 4, I'll bring you back. He says, abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And if that's not clear enough, verse 5, the next verse, he says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, he, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do Nothing. In other words, you can't do anything of spiritual value, uh, of lasting value apart from me. So abide in me, and I in you, and you will bear fruit. It's inevitable. If you are in Jesus, if you are truly connected to him, abiding in him, you will bear fruit. It is inevitable. You have to bear fruit. The life and the truth and the character of Christ will flow into you and will be seen in you. So the picture of abiding is, is just staying connected, plugged into him. Uh, you know, my, my kids get excited every time Saturday comes around because they don't get screen time on their iPads until Saturday, until the weekend. And so every Saturday, the, the kids wake up, they run and grab their iPads. And my youngest daughter, Irenea, she'll come and grab, even though she has an iPad from her grandma, she'll come and take my phone. And I'm like, why are you on my phone? You have an iPad. She says, it's dead. Her iPad is always dead. It's always dead. I'm like, why is it dead? You got to charge it. You have to plug it. And she doesn't like to be connected to this wire and, ha- and held to one place. She wants to be in her place watching her iPad. And so it's always dead. And I tell her, you have to plug it in. So she'll go and she'll plug it in and she'll wait till that, that battery bar when it turns from red to green. And as soon as it turns green, she unplugs it and she goes to her place to watch again. And before she knows it, she comes back. She says, Daddy, I need your phone. I need your phone. Why? Because it's dead. And I tell her, you have to keep it plugged in. Keep it, keep it plugged in. Keep it connected. Don't disconnect it. And because it's never connected, her apple never has full juice, full power flowing into it. In the same way, that this, this is the picture. Jesus wants us to abide. In this four-week series, we're going to look uh, deeper. We're going to take a deeper dive into what it looks like. Like to abide. How do we do it? And what comes out when we do? What does the fruit look like? But for this message, I just want to simply answer two questions to get us started. Two questions. What happens when you do abide in the vine? And what happens when you don't abide? Okay, just two simple questions. Let's start with that first one. What happens when you don't abide in the vine? When you don't. Well, when you don't abide in the vine, the simple answer, you get cut. You get cut. Let's go back to verse 2. I want to read it this time from the NIV. And here's how it goes. He cuts off. Highlight those words. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And so the one who, who's not showing any fruit, nothing's coming out, he cuts off. The word there in the original language, the Greek, is the word iro. Iro means to take away. That's the literal translation, to take away. But for you to take away a branch, you have to cut it. It's dead wood. It proves to have no life. It will never produce fruit. 
I cut off this branch from um, a, a, a grapevine over a week ago, and I left it outside. And this is what has become of it. It's dead wood. Fruit has fallen off. There's nothing good that will ever come from this again. And Jesus says that when a branch is disconnected, bearing no fruit, verse 6, he reiterates, he says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. And so essentially, it's removed and ultimately thrown away because it is unfruitful and it is no good. And what's interesting is you don't see this in the English language, but in, in, in the original language, there's a definite article. That's the word the. So it should read like this. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like the branch. Now, what is or who is the branch and some commentators suggest that maybe Jesus had in mind the one disciple who was fruitless. As he's talking to the disciples there in that upper room, he's making an example of the branch, the one who was with the vine and with the other branches, the other disciples. There was one that proved fruitless, Judas Iscariot. And you read all throughout the Gospels, every time Judas' name comes up, you don't see any fruit. In fact, you see fruitlessness. Like I think about the story where Jesus is being anointed by this, this woman with her perfume and she's just so overwhelmed that she does this beautiful act of worship anointing him and Judas is sitting there upset. He's mad. Why? Because that, that could have been sold and I could have used that money. That money could have been used for his selfish gain. And so when, when the Bible says that fruitfulness is evidence that one is in Christ and Christ is in them, the converse is true. Fruitlessness is evidence that one is not truly connected to Jesus and Christ is not in them. Fruitlessness proves that you are not in Christ. I mentioned um, at the beginning of this message, I told you the story of my my former church small group, my friend who told us about how his stepdad came to Christ. Well, in another small group meeting, he shared with us another thing. Uh, this is a different small group meeting, same friend of mine. And he wanted to share with us something that really shook him up that week. And he says, uh, this past week I was chatting with my friend online and he sent me a link to a website. And he said, it was a government website, and he clicked it open, and it's one of those websites where, by law, all the um, sex offenders and criminals are registered, and it has to be made known where they are so that you can know if you're safe and, you know, how to keep yourself and your family safe. So he opens this website, and he obviously does what many of us would do. You check your neighborhood, right? So he, he, he puts in his area, and and there's a map, and there's some people in this area who are registered offenders. And so he zooms in, and he zooms in more, and he says he's just utterly shocked that one of the pins is on his house, his address, meaning there is a registered offender, a criminal living in his house. And he clicks on the pin, and the, uh, the profile pop pops up, and there's a picture, and the picture just shakes him because it's his stepdad, Ron. Remember Ron, who as a youth came to Christ and he prayed a prayer of salvation, that Ron. And, and as my friend starts to dig a little deeper or trying to find out what happened, he finds that there was more. There was a history of, of criminal activity. There's a history of adulterous relationships. In fact, at that moment, there was a relationship that he was having, an affair in another country while still being married to his wife, which was my friend's mom. And, and so, so that, that's wrong. But wait, wait, didn't he come to Christ? Didn't he pray a prayer of salvation? So was he saved or not? Don't you get saved by praying a prayer? And I would say, yes, you do get saved. And your faith is sincere, but... But how do you know if that faith is sincere and, and you're really saved? By your fruit. Anybody can pray a prayer. But is there evidence to show for? Is there fruit in your life that you didn't just 
pray in that one moment, but you are connected to him, abiding in Jesus. Letting the life and the truth and the character of Christ flow into you is there evidence in your life. Ron, by the way, is not his real name, but he is a real person, and this is a real story, and this is true of many people who, who fail to abide and bear fruit. That doesn't mean that when you're connected to Christ, we're perfect and we don't sin. Like we're all going to sin. Every, 100% of us, we're going to sin. But even when we sin, if we are in Christ, is there any fruit to show that we're still connected in the fruit of repentance, the fruit of remorse for your sin? Is there this conviction of the Holy Spirit that I need to now pursue holiness? I need to receive his grace and pursue holiness. There should be evidence that something's going on in your heart that's coming from God. And over time, we should learn to continually demonstrate that Christ is in us. So I want to I speak to you, friends. I want to urge you, church, every single one of us, to look at your life, examine your life, and look for the fruit. Is there fruit in, in your life? And if you don't know where to start or what that looks like, Galatians 5, and 23 is a good place to start. Galatians 5 tells us the fruit of the Spirit in us is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Are any of these things growing in your life? All of these things should at least incrementally be, be growing where we are m- moving toward and looking more like Jesus rather than apart from him and less like him. Examine your life. See, uh, we come to a church like this, right, and, and it could look like this, right? From afar, it could look good and healthy and, and, and just really good things going on from afar, And yet if we would look closely and examine what's really in that bowl, we'll notice that not every branch is connected to the vine. Because you could could look closely and and everything seemingly looks connected to the vine and has life flowing into it. But that may not be true. See, many of us could come to church week after week consistently. And you sit through the entire service from beginning to end. And yet you go home and you can prove that you are not truly abiding in him. There's no fruit to show for. The the word of God never changes you. The spirit of God never transforms you. And those who are really close to you, maybe those living in your household would be able to testify. There's no fruit in that person, though they go to church. Let us not be deceived. You could come week after week, see in a bowl like this, you could look around. And yeah, you might find within that, 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 that bowl maybe... A branch that clearly has no fruit and is clear that that it's fruitless. And then there are branches that if you look closely, you might find some that that look like this. And it looks really good and really fruitful, but but the reality is it's fake. It's fake. (laughs) Fake. Right? And it looks perfect and healthy. But sometimes in the church, those who look most perfect can ultimately be the most fake. Because they go through the motion and all the activity and have the appearance of healthiness and a love for Jesus. But if you knew their private life, they're not actually abiding in Jesus. There's no real vital connection to Christ. And he is doing nothing for real inside of them. They're just going through the motion. Whether you are a pastor or a parishioner, maybe you're a leader or a lay person, maybe you're on staff or just a servant, every single one of us, we need to examine ourselves and ask, am I abiding in Jesus? Am I truly dependent on him? Am I, am I really connected to him? Is there any evidence of his life flowing into mine? We could be even for us on staff. We could be on staff for a number of reasons. I get paid to do this. This is my livelihood. So I'll lead the small group or I'll lead in that prayer or I'll I'll do it because it makes me feel good or it makes me look good. And that's not just true of people on full-time staff. That could be for any of you leading or serving in a ministry. I'm doing it because I was asked to. I'm doing it because my spouse told me to. 
I'm doing it because my parents want me to. There's a number of good reasons why we might come to church and do what we do. And Jesus warns us against failing to truly abide and dwell in Him. If we don't abide in the vine and there's never any fruit, we are cut off and we will be taken away. But the flip side, what, what does it look like when you do abide in the vine? So let's answer that question. What does it look like when you do abide in the vine? Well, go back to verse 2, and let's read that again, because the, the quick answer, you get cut. You get cut. Look at this, verse 2. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, highlight that word prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. So the, the word prune is a play off the word iro, right? Because let's recap, the branch that bears no fruit gets cut off and taken away, iro. But now he says the one that does produce fruit, something similar happens, kath iro. Kath iro is a different word. It, it's translated prune, to cleanse. And to, to prune or to cleanse, to purify requires a cutting off of that branch. That's the process, to, to cut for the purpose of cleansing and purifying so that it will now be able to produce an even more abundant supply of fruit. So just as sure as a true believer in Christ is going to bear fruit, just as sure is that that believer will be pruned. If, you bear, if you're in Christ, it's inevitable that you will bear fruit. And if you're in Christ bearing fruit, it is inevitable that you will be pruned. Because God wants to produce even more fruit in you. In that, in that place where Jesus and the disciples walked in, in the Holy Land near Jerusalem, it was an agrarian society. So you, it's very common to see vineyards, vines all over the place. You can't miss it. I don't know if you have a chance to go to the Holy Land, but you don't have to go far. Just go to Northern California, drive through wine country, Napa Valley. And if you go through... Uh, Napa Valley in the winter, you'll see miles and miles, rows and rows of empty, barren trunks, right? Twisted trunks with nothing on it. But just wait. Go back in, in, in the spring or the summer, and when you do, you will see rows and rows, miles and miles of luscious grapes, fruit growing off of, of the vine. And the, the health of the fruit in the spring and the summer is directly proportionate to how it was pruned in the winter. It has everything to do with how it is pruned and treated in the winter. Now, if you study uh, viticulture, which I had to do this week, I know nothing about viticulture, which is cultivating grapes. I just learned that there's so much to, to understand about pruning and cultivating grapes. So many different kinds of pruning. There's spur pruning and cane pruning, different methods to produce different results. You do it at different times for different reasons. For example, that you could prune the canes, which are the branches, and there's a way to prune it so that it forms the way it gets positioned and grows so that it can provide a healthier uh, supply of fruit. There's, there's kind of pruning where you, you nip the tips of certain branches so that it promotes better growth, but there's a way to do it so that you don't grow it too quickly or uh, too rapidly, but at just the right pace. There's a process called thinning where you would uh, decluster some of the, the, the grapes or the fruit on a vine so that you allow for good airflow and sunlight to be able to penetrate the branch so that it makes room for even greater growth. And then the timing matters, right? You want to do it in the winter, but if you do it too early in the winter and you, and you cut the tip, then that might freeze over by the wind and the weather so that nothing happens. So you got to wait to the right time in the winter, toward the end, maybe early spring, to, to nip it. And then it will produce a supply in the summer. So, so many ways, so many reasons, so much timing in pruning. But the fact is... If there's the slightest bit of life in it, it will be pruned by the vine dresser to produce greater fruit. 
And I think Jesus is drawing this picture that if you are demonstrating even the slightest bit of fruitfulness in you, slightest bit of life, you can expect the Lord to prune, to cleanse and to purify. And there will be times when we're going to go through a season of pruning. I don't know what season you're going through right now, but there will be a time when it's going to cause us to question God. Like, God, why are you doing this? God, how is this good that, that you should allow me to go through this? But Hebrews 12, the author reminds us this. In verse 5 and 6, he says, My son, my daughters, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And so it's out of the Father's tender and deep love for you that he might not only allow you to go through a certain season, but intentionally prune you. Will it be painful? Yes. You can count on it being painful sometimes because the cutting away of anything is almost never pleasant. There will be times when it will be an experience of loss or of grief over things that have to come to an end. There are necessary endings in our lives, necessary endings. But by the sovereignty of God, some necessary endings make way for beautiful beginnings according to the goodness of God. So he reminds us in Hebrews 12, a few verses down, he says, don't forget this, okay? For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Again, I, I'm sure in, in, in a church like this right now, there are many of you who are going through a season of struggle, and it's painful. I want to encourage you, look up, because perhaps there's a heavenly father who loves you that deeply, who is wanting to purify tenderly, pruning you, because he sees great fruit that's about to come. Is there anything unhealthy, anything stumbling, anything toxic that maybe the Lord just wants to cleanse you from? Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a recreational relationship that's causing you to, to stumble. Maybe, maybe it's a work relationship that's causing you to slander. Maybe it's a romantic relationship that's hindering your worship. And God wants to just deal with that so that there's more life and fruit. Maybe it's an activity. Maybe one that's clearly immoral. Maybe you've been addicted to pornography. Addicted to drunkenness, addicted to gambling, and that's clearly wrong, and he wants to cleanse you from that, and it's painful, but he wants to do, do good in your life. Or maybe it's something that's not that immoral. Maybe you're giving too much time to video games or, or, or computer games, or maybe you're giving too much of your emotion, your mental energy to watching others on social media. And it's just, it's not immoral, but it's just not helpful to your growth. And he wants to do a work in your life to prune and to prepare you for growth. And when he does it, as painful and uncomfortable as it is, I urge you and challenge you, don't run away. Do not disconnect from the vine. Instead, the opposite, abide in him. Abide and trust the true vine. And so sometimes God will remove the bad things in our lives to produce good fruit. But sometimes God will also remove good things in our lives to produce even greater fruit. I love what Jim Collins writes in his book, From, from, great, from Good to Great. He says this idea that, that good is the enemy of great. Good can be the enemy of great when we refuse to take hold of the great things because we're holding so tightly to what is good. Because why would I get rid of good? One way, like I said, vines are, are, are pruned is that process of thinning. You could take uh, something like this that's just really dense and you just clear the way and you prune some off so that it, it opens up the opportunity for more air and more light to penetrate the, the, the branches so that even more healthy growth can occur. So sometimes you've got to get rid of good things. 
I was reading about a, a company that was started in 1994, this small company that started in a garage. Have any of you heard of Amazon? <laughs> the small company that started in a guy's garage. And do you guys remember when Amazon first started, what they set out to sell? What did they sell at the beginning? Books. It was a bookstore. That, that was their business model. We just want to sell books online. And so they were innovating just online purchasing, developing e-commerce. It was new at the time. And they, their competitors were Borders and Barnes & Noble. That's all they wanted to do, just sell books. And it did well for them. It, it was a good business. It was profitable. They were doing really good. And yet people started requesting, well, can you start selling more than just books? Can you sell music and movies because you've made e-commerce so easy? And they could have said, nope, we're selling books. Books are good for us. It's, it's doing really well. We're, we're good with books. And yet they were willing to die to an old business model, to put aside that which was good and say, okay, let's do what else is going to bring greater profit. And so they decided to sell more and more than anything and everything from A to Z. To put smiles on people's faces all across the globe. And we will provide anything and everything from A to Z. And so it was this willingness to put aside that which is good to make room for that which is going to be great. I'm wondering if God wants to remove even the good in your life. Maybe for Stephen and Sharon Chan. And little Sammy, God wants to remove them from a good and comfortable environment there in sunny San Diego to prepare them for greater kingdom work in Mexico. I wonder if God wants to remove you from your position, to position you to a place where your gifts and your abilities are going to be maximized somewhere else. I'm wondering if God wants to remove from you really good resources that you've been depending on for so long. You've always depended and relied on these resources, and he wants to remove them to create this need in your life, this desperation almost, this gap, to make room to show that he is the God of the gaps, that he will fill it with himself, and he's producing in you this greater fruit of faith and dependence on him and not your good resource. God will sometimes remove the bad to produce great fruit, and sometimes he will remove the good to produce great fruit. Will you trust the vine dresser? And that's why, when I reflect on that truth, that's why Good Friday is really good. But Resurrection Sunday is so great. That's why. Let me explain to you what I mean, you know. There in the upper room, Jesus is with these disciples he's been with. They've walked with him, and he breaks this news that, that he's about to be taken away. He's going to be taken away by the Romans and the Jews who are going to crucify him and put him in the grave. And then after that, the Father is going to take him away and bring him back into heaven after three days. Imagine the, the crisis for these disciples who had walked with Jesus for three years, being covered in the dust of the rabbi, hanging on to every word he says, going with him to every ministry he does, and, and they're just hanging on to him, and then he says, I'm going to be gone. I'm out. The devastation in these disciples. Why would God do that? If God is a good God, a, a good vine dresser, why would he take Jesus away from them? I mean, why can't Jesus just come back from the dead and then rejoin them back on earth and keep walking with them until they die? If it's so good that the Son of God should be with them, why would the Father take a good Jesus away from them? I'll tell you why. Because when God takes away something from you that is good, it's only to make way for something that is greater. Do you believe that? Jesus tells them in the next chapter there in that upper room, John 16, verse 7, he says, very truly, I tell you, disciples, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Let me ask you, church, is there anything better than having God beside you? What is better than God beside you? It's God inside of you. That's better. It is good for the Son of God to physically be next to these 12 disciples or 11 disciples. 
It is infinitely greater for the Spirit of God to dwell in, to abide in the billions of followers of Christ who will come to him by faith if the Holy Spirit is able to dwell in us. The word to abide is to dwell. To dwell is to abide, and when the Holy Spirit dwells in us, now there is a means for us to abide in him. For the entire world to experience. When God takes away something good, it's to make room for something great. Once again, I say that when God is going to take something away in your life or in our church, whatever he's doing, it will be challenging, it will be difficult, and it may be painful. And when God does that to you, friends, listen, do not abandon the vine. Abide in him. Do not disconnect from Jesus. Depend on him. Trust the process. Trust the vine dresser. He knows what he's doing. Whenever God takes away anything good or bad, it's because he wants to produce and purify and provide fruit that will last, fruit that is greater. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and let's come before our vine dresser, the Father in heaven. Lord, we thank you so much that we can trust you. you. You know, you're the one who created the branches. You created fruit. And so, Lord, we trust that you know what you're doing in the, in the dead of winter, in that dark, cold season. Lord, when you're doing something difficult, Lord, we pray that we know spring is coming and summer is coming. There will be a day when greater things that we, we never imagined will, will be produced in our lives that will bless people, that will feed people, that will satisfy thirst and hunger in others, Lord, because of what you're doing in us. And so, Lord, we want your life in us. We want your truth in us. We want the character of Christ in us, Lord. We want it all. So would you help us to stay connected, abiding in you? For you are the vine and we are the branches. Keep us abiding in you. Lord, we worship you now. Thank you, Lord. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.